Hey everybody, welcome to chapter 9 now. We're going to start looking at the actual molecular genetics behind DNA. We've been talking about genes and alleles and chromosomes and replication and duplication and now we're actually going to get into the meat of it. And this is the last section before the end of the chapter and so we're going to start by looking at a story. Um, and up until this point we've been talking about DNA like it's something we've always known about. Well that's not true. Um, and so we're going to start way back in the beginning in 1928 with this guy named Griffith and he discovered something called transformation. Okay, He found that DNA or something in a bacteria could change a different kind of bacteria. We're going to go more into detail about that. In 1944, I don't know, 20, 22 years, uh, sorry, 18 years later, uh, another guy, another scientist named Avery came along and he was interested in what molecules or what macromolecules actually make up genes. Okay, they didn't really know what DNA was at this point. They just knew there was something in there that made up these things called genes that led to heredity. And so he worked on that in 1944. And then in 1952, this was kind of the big year of DNA. Hershey and Chase, they kind of piggybacked off of Avery's research. And they, they asked that same question, what is, what is the genetic material? Some people said it was protein. Some people said it was DNA. Uh, some people said it was RNA. And so they kind of, they tried to break this down a little bit more. What is the genetic material? Rosalind Franklin was a woman who worked in a science lab and she took the first photo or the first image of DNA in 1952. And so we're going to take a look at that picture, what it, what it looks like. And then in 1953, you've probably heard these guys more than anybody else, Watson and Crick, they took Rosalind's picture and they actually described the shape or the, the structure of DNA. Structure of DNA. So we're going to take a look at them. And then in 1977, and this is one we're not really going to dive too deep into, the, Gilbert was the first guy to sequence DNA. So DNA is like a code. Um, and up until 1977, we couldn't read it. We, uh, we knew basically what it was there, but Gilbert was the first guy to really say, okay, here is what it is, and we broke it down, and now we can interpret that into something meaningful. So we're going to break all of these down in turns. Uh, we're going to start with Gif Griffith in 1928, and he studied, uh, let me switch to a different color here, I'm tired of red. Uh, he studied pneumonia. And pneumonia is caused by bacteria. So what he did is he took these ammonia cells and he put them into different kinds of mice. Or, and he took different kinds of pneumonia and put them into mice. So he found something really, really interesting. Uh, and so before we can do that, um, we're going to look at R cells. And these are the ones that do not make you sick. These do not cause sickness. So these are a kind of pneumonia bacteria that your body can manage. The other kind are S cells, and these ones will kill you. Okay, they will make you sick. And so looking over here on the diagram, all right, so we took living R cells, so living, growing, uh, you know, reproducing R cells, non-sickness. You inject it into a mouse, and we expect that the mouse would stay healthy, and that's what happened. He did the same thing with S cells. So these ones should kill the mouse, and what he saw, again, is that he took the S cells, injected it into a mouse, and it killed the mouse. So then what he did to control this is he took some of these S cells and killed them. He heat, he, um, heat them and up to a point where they couldn't survive, just like if you were to, to bake in an oven, you would not survive. He did the same thing, and so killing the S cells means that they should not make the mouse sick, and that's what he saw. And so then what he took is he took heat-killed S cells, so ones that would leave the mouse healthy, and mixed them with some living R cells, and what happened was the mouse died. Okay, so this mouse all of a sudden had some S cells as part of it, but that doesn't really make sense because they were dead. Well, what he discovered was this thing called transformation. Okay, transformation. So when living... R cells were mixed with dead S cells that should be in red. Something in that bacteria changed those cells into the deadly kind. And so this was kind of the first step into this genetics area after Mendel looking at the molecules. So that was Griffith in 1928. 
1944, uh, Avery came around and he didn't know what molecule, what macromolecules of proteins, carbs, lipids, whatever, made up genes. And so based on Griffith's work, he mixed up some pneumonia bacteria. He mixed pneumonia bacteria with enzymes that destroyed everything. Carbs, protein, lipids. So all these macromolecules and even RNA, they knew about RNA, they knew what it was. And what they saw was that transformation still happened. It still changed in this, that what happened essentially was that you took some dead bacteria, transformation occurs and then the mice died. And so what does this mean? Well, when it really gets down to it, looking at, at these results, if we mix with enzymes that destroy everything except DNA, this probably means that DNA is most likely the genetic information. Okay, but process of uh, elimination. DNA is probably this genetic information. So that was Avery in 1944. Well, good scientists are always asking questions and always seeing if they can repeat an experiment. So Hershey and Chase came along in 1952 and looked at Avery's and they said, well, okay, DNA is probably it, but some people like us, we still think that protein is the genetic information. So what they did is they set out to solve that problem. And the way they did that is they took some bacteriophages and these are viruses it's blue. These are viruses that infect bacteria. They took a bacteriophage and they labeled it with radioactive highlights. It's a really, really fancy highlighter. Uh, and they labeled different parts of a virus. In one, they labeled the outside, okay? And the outside of a bacteria is, or a virus is made of protein. So they're isolating the protein. And then the other one, in the other one, they labeled the inside in here in the middle, and this is made of DNA. And so they let it infect a bacteria, and they looked at um, what happened. So on the left over here, there was no transformation. Okay, nothing about this bacteria changed. On the right, what they saw was that the DNA of the bacteria was changed to match the virus. And so what they were able to determine then after some mixing. Okay, so this goes through mixing and blending. They put it into a big blender and spin it around and mix it all up. And what they determined was that the genetic material was DNA. So um, all of these experiments kind of build on one another and that kind of leads to this culmination. So Rosalind Franklin was a scientist that took a very picture, a important picture of DNA using x-rays. And so what I want you to do real quick is what does this picture look like to you? What would you tell from this or what could you infer? And finally, in 1953, uh, Watson and Crick were credited uh, with Time Magazine, I think, what were the most important discovery of the 20th century. And what they determined is that DNA is a double helix. Not a double rainbow, a double helix. Or a twisted ladder. That's a better visual. Okay, so it's got two sides, right? And over here on this picture, it's got two sides. There's one, two and they spin around each other like a corkscrew and, so, and they're hollow. So if we look back at Rosalind's picture, okay, we see this empty space in the middle right here. This is that hollow core of the DNA and what we're seeing on the outside here are the shadows of the, the, the outside and the base pairs down the middle. And Chargoff was another scientist, you don't really need to worry about him, but what he said is that A, the base pair, adenine over here, always pairs with T, adenine always pairs with thymine, and guanine always pairs with cytosine, or G always with C. So as you can see, a lot of history is built up to this structure of DNA. Um, take some time to read through it. It's a really, really cool story, and we'll be talking about it every day from here on out pretty much.